Hi, everyone. Thank you for bearing with us as we had some late seating. Um, happy Lunar New Year. I'm Claudia Bester, the Director of Public Programs here at the Hammer Museum, and I want to welcome you all today. Um, today's talk on recent Supreme Court rulings is with UC Berkeley Dean Erwin Chemerinsky. Today is the 50th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, which is a coincidence, but appropriate, since we're going to be talking about the Supreme Court's sharp fear to the right. Personally, I feel a lot of despair about the Supreme Court and the future of all of our constitutional rights right now, but I can really think of no better guide than uh, Erwin Chemerinsky to help us feel our way right now. Uh, Erwin Chemerinsky is the dean of the UC Berkeley School of Law. He's the author of 11 books, including leading case books and treatises about constitutional law, criminal procedure, and federal jurisdiction. Some of his most recent books include Presumed Guilty, How the Supreme Court Empowered the Police and Subverted Civil Rights, which was published in 2021, in which he reveals how the Supreme Court allows the perpetuation of racist pol policing by presuming that suspects, especially people of color, are guilty. Prior to that, he published We the People, a progressive reading of the Constitution for the 21st Century, published in November 2017. Um, he also, printed uh, in the same year, published Closing the Courthouse Doors, How Your Constitutional Rights Became Unenforceable, and, in, and also Free Speech on Campus with Howard Gilman. His many other books include The Conservative Assault on the Constitution and The Case Against the Supreme Court. His most recent book is called Worse Than Nothing, The Dangerous Fallacy of Originalism. And in it, he talks about how what was once the fringe theory of a few extremely conservative legal scholars has become a well-accepted mode of constitutional interpretation. So after today's um, talk and audience Q&A, we're going to have some light refreshments and copies of these books for sale in the theater lobby. And Professor Chemerinsky will be happy to sign them for you. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our esteemed guest speaker, Dean Erwin Chemerinsky. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and thanks to all of you for coming. On Friday, September 18th, 2020, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died at age 87. Just a little over a month later, on Monday, October 26th, Justice Amy Coney Barrett was confirmed to replace Justice Ginsburg. This then meant that there are six conservative justices on the Supreme Court, Chief Justice John Roberts, Justice Clarence Thomas, Justice Samuel Alito, Justice Neil Gorsuch, Justice Brett Kavanaugh, and Justice Amy Coney Barrett. The Supreme Court's term last year started on Monday, October the 4th, and ended on Thursday, June 30th, 2022. It was the first term with all six of these conservative justices present on the bench. You might have seen two days after the term ended, on Saturday, July 2nd, the headline in the New York Times was that it was by its calculation the most conservative year in the Supreme Court since 1931. What the Supreme Court did last year affects all of us, often in the most important, the most intimate aspects of our lives. I'm so honored to have this opportunity to do three talks at the Hammer about the Supreme Court. What I'd like to talk about today is how we got here and what the conservative court has already meant. When I have the pleasure of coming back on Wednesday, February 22nd, I want to talk about what the Supreme Court is likely to do next this year in the foreseeable future. And then finally, I conclude the lecture series on March 22nd by talking about how should the Constitution be interpreted 
you know, where do we go from here? Can we reform the Supreme Court? And if so, how? I think it's important to begin this lecture series by addressing directly the question of how did we get here? As I said, there are six conservative justices, all appointed by Republican presidents. There are three liberal justices who were appointed by Democratic presidents. Last year was Justices Breyer, Senator and Kagan. This year is Justices Senator Kagan and Jackson. It's worth pausing to note that this is unique in American history. Until recently, we had liberal justices appointed by Republican presidents. Think here of Justice John Paul Stevens or Justice David Souter, or before that, Justice William Brennan or Chief Justice Earl Warren. And we certainly had conservative justices appointed by Democratic presidents. Think of Byron White, who had been appointed by President John F. Kennedy, or William Rehnquist, who had been appointed by President Richard Nixon. I think the perfect correspondence between the ideology of the justice and the political party of the president who made the appointment heightens our sense of a very politicized Supreme Court. Of the nine justices, Seven of them were raised or are Catholic. One is Protestant. One is Jewish. Of the nine justices, eight of them went to Harvard or Yale for law school. One went to Notre Dame. Of the nine justices, eight of them were Federal Court of Appeals judges before going on to the Supreme Court. Only Justice Elena Kagan had never served on a court before becoming a justice. How did we get here? Between 1960 and 2020, there were 32 years with a Republican president and 28 years with a Democratic president. That's almost even. In fact, in 2024, it'll be 32 years with a Democratic president and 32 years with a Republican president since 1960. But between 1960 and 2020, Republican presidents picked 15 justices for the Supreme Court while Democratic presidents picked only eight justices for the Supreme Court. I can put this another way. As you know, President Donald Trump picked three justices for the court in his four years in the White House. The prior three Democratic presidents, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama, served a combined 20 years in the White House. In those two decades, they picked only four justices. The composition of the Supreme Court now, and for a long time to come, is determined by the outcome of the 2016 presidential election. Had Hillary Clinton won, and had she picked the justices to replace Scalia, Kennedy, and Ginsburg, it would be a radically different court. But because Donald Trump got to pick Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, it's going to be a very conservative court and for a long time to come. Think of the ages of the conservative justices. Clarence Thomas is the oldest. He's 74 years old. Samuel Alito is the next oldest at 72. John Roberts is 67. The three Trump appointees, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett, are all still in their 50s. I've long thought that the best predictor of a long lifespan is being confirmed for a seat on the Supreme Court. <laughs> After all, Justice Stevens didn't retire until he was age 90. Justice Ginsburg passed away at age 87. So it's easy to imagine five or six of these justices being together for another decade or two. The bottom line is that if you're politically conservative, this is a time to be jubilant. This is what conservatives have wanted for the Supreme Court for over a half century. But if you're politically liberal, this is a time to be scared. Well, what did the Supreme Court do last year? First full term with these six conservative justices. And what's it likely to mean for all of our lives? That's what I'd like to talk about this afternoon. And I want to talk about four areas where the Supreme Court dramatically changed the law. 
and I use the word dramatically intentionally. These were not modest or incremental changes, and they were all in one political direction, clearly to the right. And the areas that I want to talk about this afternoon with you are abortion rights, the administrative state, religion in the Constitution, and the Second Amendment. Let me start with abortion. Everyone here is familiar with the Supreme Court's decision from Friday, June 24th, 2022, in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health, where the Supreme Court overruled Roe versus Wade. As you know, the Supreme Court 50 years ago today, in Roe versus Wade, held that states cannot prohibit abortions prior to viability. In 1992, in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the Supreme Court reaffirmed Roe v. Wade. The court said it was reaffirming, quote, the essential holding that states could not prohibit abortions prior to viability. What's often forgotten, what I think didn't get enough attention in the media, is that both Roe and Casey in protecting abortion rights were bipartisan decisions. Roe was a 7-2 to two ruling. The majority opinion was written by Justice Harry Blackmun, who, as I mentioned, put on the Supreme Court by Republican President Richard Nixon. The majority included Chief Justice Warren Burger and Justice Lewis Powell, also Nixon appointees. The two dissenting justices in Roe were Byron White, a Kennedy appointee, and William Rehnquist, a Nixon appointee. Even more dramatic, in 1992, when the Supreme Court reaffirmed Roe v. Wade, it was a 5-4 decision. All five justices in the majority who voted to protect abortion rights had been put on the Supreme Court by Republican presidents. Justice Blackmun by President Nixon, Justice Stevens by President Ford, Justice O'Connor and Kennedy by President Reagan, Justice Souter by the first President Bush. Science and medicine tell us that viability is about the 23rd or 24th week of pregnancy. Dobbs involved a Mississippi law that prohibits abortions after the 15th week of pregnancy. The Federal District Court in Mississippi, the Federal Court of Appeals, declared the Mississippi law unconstitutional. But the Supreme Court, in a 6-3 decision, upheld the Mississippi law. Five justices used this as the occasion to expressly overrule Roe v. Wade. Justice Samuel Alito wrote for the court, joined by Justice Thomas, and the three Trump justices, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. Justice Alito said that Roe v. Wade was, quote, egregiously wrong and, quote, exceedingly poorly reasoned. He said the Constitution should be interpreted to protect a right only if it's explicitly stated in the text or part of its original meaning or there's a long, unbroken historical tradition of safeguarding the liberty. He said abortion doesn't fit into any of these categories. He said precedent, stare decisis, there's as little weight when a decision is egregiously wrong. He said that the issue of abortion is left to the political process. He said laws restricting abortion should be upheld so long as there is some reasonable justification. Chief Justice Roberts concurred in the judgment. He said he would uphold the Mississippi law but not reach the question whether to overrule Roe and whether states could prohibit abortion even before 15 weeks into pregnancy. Justices Breyer, Sutter, and Kagan wrote a vehement joint dissent. They defended Roe v. Wade. They said, since early in the 20th century, the Supreme Court has protected aspects of privacy and autonomy under the liberty of the Due Process Clause. They said laws prohibiting abortion infringe a woman's rights to privacy and autonomy. They said, precedent, stare decisis, deserve great weight. There should be a better reason for overruling a prior decision than the majority of the current court would come to a different conclusion.
they lamented the practical effects on pregnant people's lives in the United States. Well, what is this decision going to mean? For now, it means that the issue of abortion is left to each state. Some states will prohibit virtually all abortions. States like West Virginia, Alabama, Oklahoma already have laws that prohibit all abortions from the moment of conception, except if necessary to protect the woman's life. Other states will continue to protect abortion rights. California voters in November 2022 amended the state constitution to make even clearer the laws of the state protect a woman's right to choose. It's estimated that slightly over half the states will prohibit most or all abortions, and slightly under half the states, like California, will continue to protect abortion rights. Think of the practical effect of this. It's a point the dissent made. For pregnant women in states where abortion is illegal, if they want an abortion and they have resources, they'll travel to states where abortion is allowed. But for economically disadvantaged pregnant persons, for teenagers who don't have resources, they will again face the choice between an unwanted child and an unsafe back alley abortion. Before New York became the first state in this country to legalize abortion in the 1960s, 25% of the abortions in England were performed on American women. It wasn't poor women who were going to England for abortions. I intentionally chose the words, for now, this is left to the states. It's certainly possible that Congress could pass a law creating a national right to abortion and thereby preempt state laws that prohibit it. Such a bill passed the House of Representatives last spring only to die in the Senate because of a Republican filibuster. Now, with a Republican House, there's no chance that such a bill will get through Congress. Correspondingly, the next time there's a Republican president in a Republican Congress, I expect they will try to pass a bill prohibiting all abortions in the United States, preempting laws like California's that allow abortion. The Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs is already leading to a great deal of litigation. Must states have exceptions to allow abortions to protect the life of the woman? How is that to be determined? Must states have exceptions to protect the health of the woman? How is that to be determined? Must there be an exception for pregnancies that result from rape or incest? What about state laws like that in Texas that prohibit importing into the state medications that will induce an abortion? Are those preempted by federal law? Many states are now considering adopting laws imposing greater restrictions with regard to abortion. There's a bill right now in the Missouri legislature that would make it a crime for a woman to cross state lines to get an abortion. There's a bill now in the Idaho legislature that would prohibit methods of contraception that are seen as acting after conception, like the morning after pill or the IUD. And what about other constitutional rights that are protected under the word liberty in the due process clause, even though the rights aren't enumerated in the text of the document? In a concurring opinion in Dobbs, Justice Clarence Thomas said, now that the courts overruled Roe versus Wade, next the court should overrule Griswold versus Connecticut, the 1965 decision that said there's a constitutional right to purchase and use contraceptives, Lawrence versus Texas, the 2003 decision that said that states cannot prohibit private, consensual, adult, same-sex sexual activity, in Obergefell versus Hodges, the 2015 decision that said that states cannot prohibit same-sex marriage. Justice Alito, in a majority opinion, Dobbs said, none of these other rights are in jeopardy because none involve potential life. 
But remember the criteria that Justice Alito set out at the beginning of his opinion. He said a right should be protected only if it's in the text, part of the Constitution's original meaning, or there's a long, unbroken tradition. None of those rights fit in any of these categories. There are already cases on the way to the Supreme Court that would ask the Supreme Court to reconsider its decision Obergefell, the decision that said there's a right to marriage equality for gays and lesbians. In Obergefell, it was a five to four decision. The dissenters included Chief Justice John Roberts as well as just Alito and Thomas. And there are three more conservatives who joined the court since. So it's hard to be sanguine in light of the decision in Dobbs that these other rights will continue to be protected by the court. Since the 1920s, the court has protected under the word the liberty of the due process clause, the right to marry, the right to procreate, the right to custody of one's children, the right to keep the family together, the right of parents to control the upbringing of their children, the right to purchase and use contraceptives, the right of competent adults to refuse even light needed medical treatment, the right of consenting adults to engage in same-sex sexual activity in private. None of these rights are in the text of the Constitution. None were part of the original meaning when the Constitution was written. None would have a long, unbroken historical tradition. What does it mean for the court to take such a restrictive attitude as to what's protected under the Constitution. The second area that I want to talk about today with regard to recent Supreme Court decisions concerns the administrative state. And this received much less in the way of headlines, but it's something the Supreme Court is doing that truly will affect all of us and perhaps all of us in danger. What I want to talk about is a decision that came down on Thursday, June 30th of 2022. It was West Virginia versus Environmental Protection Agency. The Obama administration adopted the Clean Power Plan to restrict greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants. Coal-fired power plants are a major source of the pollution that's leading to climate change. The Trump administration repealed the Clean Power Plan. It adopted its own affordable clean energy plan. It was much more permissive with regard to greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants. A federal court of appeals in Washington, D.C. found that the Trump administration had violated federal law in the way it rescinded the Obama policy. West Virginia and two coal companies asked the Supreme Court to hear the matter. The Biden administration said, there's no case or controversy here. The Biden administration said, we're not implementing the Obama plan. We're not implementing the Trump plan. We'll create our own plan that we'll announce in the near future. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court took the case. And in a six to three decision, the Supreme Court said that the Environmental Protection Agency lacked the authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants. This is significant in itself. Justice Kagan and her dissent began by describing the ravages of climate change. She talked about how climate change is endangering the planet and all life upon it. There's no mention of this in the majority opinion. But the reason I'm talking about this case today goes beyond even this extremely important area of pollution and climate change. It goes to the reasoning employed by the Supreme Court. Chief Justice Roberts said, when there's a major question of economic and political significance, federal administrative agencies can act only if there's clear direction from Congress. He said, here, Congress did not give clear direction that the Environmental Protection Agency could regulate greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants. Therefore, the EPA regulation was struck down. Justice Kagan, in her dissent, said, the federal statute, the Clean Air Act, gives to the Environmental Protection Agency the authority to regulate pollution from stationary sources. 
coal-fired power plants are stationary sources. They therefore fit within the scope of EPA regulatory authority. She also questioned the reasoning of the majority on relying on the so-called major questions doctrine. Even if you're a lawyer, you're a judge, law professor, until very recently, you never heard of this thing called the major questions doctrine. Chief Justice Roberts said, it means that when there's a major question of economic or political significance, a federal agency can act only with clear direction from Congress. Well, ask yourself this. What's a major question of economic or political significance? The Supreme Court doesn't say. What's sufficient congressional direction to meet the major questions doctrine? The Supreme Court doesn't say. What the Supreme Court has done is open the door to challenges to every kind of federal agency regulation. When agencies regulate to protect health and safety, when agencies regulate to protect the environment, when agencies regulate business, all of this is now subject to challenge because any business can say, this is a major question of economic or political significance. The agency lacks authority. I was in Washington this past week and did a talk about the Supreme Court. And some lawyers who have federal regulatory practice said their clients think everything is a major question. And they want to challenge everything that the agencies are doing. And the Supreme Court has opened the door to that. One of the themes of the conservative Roberts Court is a great hostility to the powers of administrative agencies. This is something that conservatives have lamented for years. Now they've got the majority of the court to carry it out. And I think we all have to pay careful attention to where courts go and what types of regulations that are needed to protect our health and safety to safeguard our environment, are likely to be struck down. The third area that I want to talk about today concerns the Supreme Court in religion. And if you ask me when there, is, when there has been the greatest change in constitutional law because of the shift in the composition of the Supreme Court, I would point to the First Amendment's religion clauses. There, of course, are two provisions in the First Amendment that deal with religion. One says that the government may make no law respecting the establishment of religion. This is commonly called the Establishment Clause. The other says that the government may make no law abridging free exercise of religion. Obviously, it's called the Free Exercise Clause. For decades, the Supreme Court took a robust view of the Establishment Clause. The court saw it as embodying the words of Thomas Jefferson, that there should be a wall that separates church and state. At the same time, the court took a fairly minimalist view of the free exercise clause. The Supreme Court said that we don't give exemptions to general laws on account of religious beliefs. There was a case in 1990, Employment Division versus Smith, which held exactly this. If you've heard of it, you might remember it as the Native American peyote case. Oregon law prohibited consumption of peyote, hallucinogenic substance. Native Americans brought a challenge arguing that their religious rituals required the use of peyote. The Supreme Court ruled against the Native Americans. Justice Antonin Scalia, an ardent conservative, wrote the opinion. He said, in our society, we don't give exemptions to laws on account of religious beliefs. He said, we're such a pluralistic society with regard to religion, we couldn't begin to give everyone an exception if they had a religious objection to a particular law. Also, once courts would begin to give religious exceptions to laws, they would face the daunting, the impossible task of defining what is a religion of trying to figure out what's a sincerely held religious belief. But now, the conservative Roberts Court has flipped the analysis with regard to the religion clauses. 
the court takes a very minimal view of the establishment clause, little violates it, and a very robust view of the free exercise clause. And so I want to talk about two cases came down in late June of 2022, and ones that again can have a real effect on our lives. The first of these is Carson versus Macon, which came down on Tuesday, June 21st. There are parts of the state of Maine that are too rural to support public school systems. In these areas, school administrative units give money to parents to send their children to private school. The money can be used in any private school so long as it's secular, can't be used in religious schools. About 5,000 children a year get this benefit from the state of Maine. Two families that wanted to send their children to religious school brought a challenge to this. The federal district court in Maine, the federal court of appeals, ruled in favor of the state and against the parents. The court said Maine has an important interest in providing a free secular education to all of the children in the state. The court said Maine has an interest in not taxing some people to support the religion of others. The Supreme Court, in a six to three decision, ruled against the state of Maine. Chief Justice Roberts wrote for the court. Justices Breyer and Sotomayor each wrote dissents joined by Justice Kagan. Chief Justice Roberts said, whenever the government supports secular private education, it is constitutionally required to subsidize religious education as well. He relied on a precedent that was just five years old. It was a case called Trinity Lutheran versus Comer from June of 2017. It involved the state of Missouri providing money to schools for surfaces of playgrounds. And the state would give the money to any public school or secular private school, but not to religious schools. The Supreme Court declared this unconstitutional. Chief Justice Roberts said it's odious, that was his word, for the government to subsidize secular private schools, but not religious ones. But in footnote three of his opinion, he said, this is just a case about aid for playgrounds and nothing else. But we know that's not how the Supreme Court operates. And now, of course, the Supreme Court has said it's about all government aid. As Justice Sotomayor pointed out in her dissent, until Trinity Lutheran in 2017, never before in American history had the Supreme Court found that the Constitution required the government to subsidize religious schools. What are the potential implications of this? Why do I think it'll matter so much? Let me start with California. As you know, there are charter schools in California. This is where the government pays for the school, but it's privately run. California has a law that says that charter schools must be secular. Can this be constitutional after the Supreme Court's decisions in Trinity Lutheran and in Carson versus Macon? There are many government programs that provide aid for secular uses, but not comparable religious ones. Many state and local governments have programs that provide funds for drug and alcohol rehabilitation. These generally require that it be a secular program. It can't be a faith-based program. Are these laws still constitutional? I was involved a few years ago in a case coming out of New Jersey where local governments provide funds for historic preservation of buildings, but won't provide money if it's a building that's used in active religious worship, churches, synagogues, mosques. The New Jersey Supreme Court, seven and nothing, upheld those laws. But now I would think they're unconstitutional. Perhaps I can put it this way. For decades, the issue before the Supreme Court was always when does government aid to religious schools violate the Establishment Clause? Now the question is, when is the failure to write aid to religious schools unconstitutional as a violation of free exercise of religion? The Supreme Court's decision in Carson versus Macon, and before that in Trinity Lutheran versus Comer, 
are unprecedented in requiring the government to provide subsidies for religious education. Six days later, on Monday, June 27th, the Supreme Court decided Kennedy versus Bremerton School District. Joseph Kennedy was a high school football coach in Bremerton in Washington State. He made it a practice of going after the games onto the football field to the 50-yard line and kneeling and praying. He said he was a devout Christian and required that, believed that his religion required him to do so. One of the players on Kennedy's team, through his father, complained about this. Sometimes when Kennedy would go onto the field to pray, players from that team, players from the other team, would join. And the father said that his son and the family were atheists, and the son felt pressure to join in the prayer or feared he wouldn't get as much playing time. The school said to Coach Kennedy, stop going on the field after games and praying like this. We believe that would be an impermissible establishment of religion. Kennedy briefly complied. He then, after a brief hiatus, began the practice of going onto the field after games and delivering a Christian inspirational message that he called a prayer. Sometimes again joined by players of his team, sometimes players of both teams, sometimes people from the stands. The school suspended Coach Kennedy and gave him a poor performance evaluation. Kennedy sued and said that to keep him from praying violated his free exercise of religion and his free speech rights. The federal district court and the federal court of appeals ruled against Coach Kennedy. They said for over 60 years, without exception, the Supreme Court had said that prayer in public schools in all of its forms violates the Constitution. In fact, there had even been a prior decision about prayer at high school football games. Santa Fe Independent School District versus Doe in 2000 found it was unconstitutional to have student-delivered prayers before high school football games. But the United States Supreme Court, in a 6-3 to three decision, ruled in favor of Coach Kennedy. Justice Gorsuch wrote for the six conservatives, Justice Sotomayor for the three liberals. I've rarely seen a case where the majority and the dissent disagree more about the facts of the case. Justice Gorsuch began his opinion by saying, this is about the right of a football coach on his own time to pray by himself. Justice Sotomayor included pictures in her dissent, which is unusual, so you could see Coach Kennedy surrounded by players. The Supreme Court said it violated Coach Kennedy's free exercise of religion to keep him from praying. They also said it violated his freedom of speech to keep him from praying because it wasn't government prayer. He was, in the words of Justice Alito, doing so in a lull in the activities. Justice Sotomayor in her dissent emphasized, as at the lower courts, that for 60 years without exception, the Supreme Court had said that prayer in public schools, even voluntary prayer, is impermissible. The court had frequently talked about the inherent coercion that students feel to participate in prayers when teachers, when other students are engaging them. In 1971, in a case called Lemon versus Kurtzman, the Supreme Court articulated a test for when government action is an impermissible establishment in religion. The court said that the government violates the establishment clause if its purpose is advanced religion, or if its primary effect is advancing religion, or this excess of government entanglement with religion. In dozens of cases, the Supreme Court used the Lemon Test. In hundreds, thousands of cases, lower courts did. Justice Gorsuch, writing for the majority in Kennedy versus Bremerton School, said that the test from Lemon versus Kurtzman has been overruled. So notice, Justice in Dobbs, the court overruled Roe versus Wade after 49 years. Here, the Supreme Court was overruling a 51-year-old precedent. So what replaces the Lemon test? Justice Gorsuch said the government violates the Establishment Clause only if it coerces 
religious behavior. He said the court hasn't yet agreed on a test for coercion. He said in deciding what violates the Establishment Clause, the line is to be drawn based on, quote, the thoughts of the Founding Fathers. So in deciding what violates the Establishment Clause in 2022 or 2023, we have to ask, what did the framers of the First Amendment in 1791 see as unconstitutional? I don't mean to sound cynical, but how are we going to know what they thought in 1791 about the right of a high school football coach to go on the field and pray after games? But that is now the test, and I think very little will violate the Establishment Clause. Now, to be clear, this is not about school-organized, school-directed prayer, but it does clearly mean that teachers can pray on the job even when they're joined by students. So a teacher in the classroom, before the bell rings, at recess, at lunch, when kids have their heads down on the desk, after school, can engage in prayer and be joined by students. As Justice Sonar says, this opens the door to prayer in public schools in a way that's been closed for over six decades. Again, to see what a dramatic change this is in the law. For decades, the holding was that prayer in schools violates the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. Now the Supreme Court is saying the exclusion of prayer violates free exercise, religion, and free speech. After all, any restriction on prayer, by definition, limits the speech and the free exercise religion of those who want to pray. The fourth and final area that I want to talk about from last term concerns the Second Amendment. From 1791, when the Second Amendment was ratified, until June of 2008, not one federal, state, or local gun regulation was struck down by the United States Supreme Court. In the handful of Supreme Court cases about the Second Amendment, the justices always said that the amendment means what it says. It's a right to have guns for militia service. The Second Amendment says a well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of free state, the right of people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. In June 2008, in District of Columbia versus Heller, the Supreme Court for the first time in history struck down a gun law. It was a DC ordinance. The law was 32 years old at the time. It prohibited private ownership or possession of handguns. The decision was five to four. Justice Scalia wrote for the court. And he said the second amendment protects the right of people to have guns in their homes for the sake of security. He said the Second Amendment's not absolute. The government could put guns in sensitive places, like near courthouses or airports or schools. He said the government can regulate who has guns, like preventing those with a felony conviction from possessing a weapon. He said the government can prohibit particularly dangerous weapons. Two years later, the Supreme Court said that state and local governments have to comply with the Second Amendment. But from 2010, until Thursday, June 23rd, 2022, the Supreme Court didn't decide another Second Amendment case. On that day, last June, the court decided New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. It involved a New York law that was initially adopted in 1907. It restricts having guns in public. In order to have a gun in public, and particularly a concealed weapon, a person would need a permit. New York law said in order to get a permit, someone would need to show a safety need for it. California law was similar. California law said in order to have a concealed weapon, an individual would need a concealed weapons permit. In order to get that, a person would need to show a safety need for possessing a concealed weapon. Challenge was brought to the New York law. The federal district court, the federal court of appeals upheld it. But the Supreme Court again in a 6-3 to three decision, declared the New York law unconstitutional. Justice Clarence Thomas wrote for the court. Justice Stephen Breyer wrote for the dissent. 
Just as Thomas said that the Second Amendment protects the right of people to have guns in public, including concealed weapons. If this is all the Supreme Court said, the case would be significant. It's the first time in history the Supreme Court has ever said there's a right to have guns in public, a right to have concealed weapons. But then the court went even further. And the court said the only kind of gun regulations that should be allowed are those that were historically permitted. For all other constitutional rights, the government can interfere if it has a sufficient justification and if the means are needed to accomplish the goal. To make this less abstract, the government can engage in race discrimination if it can show that it is a compelling reason and there's no other way to achieve the goal. The government can infringe free speech, even discriminating against people based on their viewpoints, if the government has a compelling interest and there's no other way to achieve the goal. One would have thought that if the Supreme Court wanted to provide protection for gun rights, it would follow that law. But Justice Thomas rejected it. He said it doesn't matter how compelling the government need, doesn't matter whether the means are necessary. The only kind of gun regulations that will be allowed are those that were historically permitted. And he said, we're not going to answer now whether historical is limited to 1791, when the second was adopted, which includes 1868, when the 14th Amendment was ratified. Justice Barrett wrote a separate opinion saying the court's not deciding whether the only gun regulations permitted are those that were allowed in 1791, where this includes 1868. Justice Thomas said the Second Amendment is not limited to protecting the weapons that existed in 1791, just as the First Amendment isn't limited to the types of media that existed in 1791. He said courts will have to reason by analogy. Justice Breyer wrote a vehement dissent. He began by talking about the toll of gun violence in the United States, the number of people who die, gun deaths each year. He talked about the recent mass shootings in the United States. He talked about historically how there has been regulation of concealed weapons. And he talked about how little sense it makes to limit the meaning of the Constitution to what it was in 1791 or 1868. There is no doubt that the Supreme Court's decision from last June 23rd is leading to challenges to all kinds of gun regulations. I have the pleasure of speaking at judicial conferences in many parts of the country. And over and again, judges are coming up to me and telling me of the cases in their courts challenging gun laws in light of the Supreme Court's decision in Bruin. I'll give you some examples. Courts in Delaware and Texas have declared unconstitutional laws that make it a crime to sell guns without serial numbers. These are so-called ghost guns. Why? Because there weren't laws in 1791 prohibiting ghost guns. Some courts are now hearing challenges to laws that prohibit people with a felony conviction from having weapons, because those laws didn't exist in 7 January 1868. There's a federal law that says that someone with a restraining order in a domestic violence situation can't have a firearm. That's being challenged in courts as well, and on and on. Well, I've picked four examples for you. Abortion, administrative law, religion and the Constitution, in the Second Amendment. I talked about decisions that came down between Tuesday, June 21st and Thursday, June 30th of 2022. These four areas share something in common. If you would think about what conservatives care most about, the conservative political agenda, all of these fit within it. It's not that the Supreme Court was following some neutral methodology. It's not that the Supreme Court was discovering the original intent of the Constitution. Unless you believe that the framers of the Constitution and the current Republican platform are the same, it's clear what was going on. This is a court, like all courts, that has an agenda. And it is very much a conservative political agenda.
As I said at the beginning, for those who are politically conservative, it's a time to be jubilant. For those who are politically liberal, it's a time to be petrified. I'm teaching constitutional law this semester. I'll teach tomorrow morning at 8.30. And I have to tell you, I've been a law professor for 43 years, and I've never seen some of my students as discouraged as they are now. A couple of weeks ago, I had the tremendous privilege of interviewing Justice Sotomayor at the Conference of the Association of American Law Schools. And I thought a lot about what questions I would ask her, being mindful of the bounds of propriety. I realized I couldn't ask her directly about the cases that I've just summarized for you. So my first question to her was, last year was a momentous year in the Supreme Court. How are you? <laughs> and her answer began with, I'm OK now. And then she talked about the difficulty in dealing, especially with the Dobbs decision. And I decided to make my last question for her the, what I said to you. I said, I've never seen some of my students so discouraged. I'm about to teach constitutional law again. What should I tell them? What gives you hope? And her answer was so eloquent, I won't do it justice by paraphrasing it. She talked about the long sweep of history, the tremendous advances in liberty and equality that there have been. She quoted Dr. Martin Luther King's famous line that the arc of the moral universe is long and it bends towards justice. She said, so many people gave up their lives to fight for our civil rights. We can't abandon their legacy by giving in to despair. Last April, when I concluded my constitutional law class, I said I wanted to speak to the students who were feeling discouraged about the Supreme Court. And I said to them, we really have only two choices. Either we give up or we fight harder. And that means we only have one choice, to fight harder, better than we ever have before. And what I hope to do in the next two lectures is talk about where the Supreme Court is going to go this year in the foreseeable future, and then what it is we can do about it and how we should interpret the Constitution. So I've used my time now, but we now have a half hour for questions. I understand the ushers will take questions and we'll read them because the lights, it's not easy for me to see people in the audience to call on you. But glad to take questions. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. I'm also a teacher. And when you say fight, what does that look like that I can share with my students? Sure. This is a coming attraction for the third lecture on March 22nd. I hope you'll come back for it. I think it involves many different things. I think it involves looking to other courts and other sources of law. We need to look to state courts and state law where the Supreme Court won't protect rights. We've seen this with regard to abortion. There have been surprising victories in the political process with regard to abortion in Kansas, in Kentucky, in Michigan. I can give you examples with regard to regulating police where states have stepped in, local governments have stepped in, where the Supreme Court has failed us. 40 years ago, the Supreme Court refused to outlaw police use of the chokehold has led to the death of George Floyd, for that Eric Garner, and others. But now, the state of California, many other state and local governments have prohibited use of the chokehold. So some of it is looking to other sources of law, looking to the political process. Um, some of the answer to the question has to be, in terms of students, to recognize how much elections matter, how much voting matters. Had 32,000 votes come out differently in 2016 in three states, Hillary Clinton would have been president and this talk would have been different. Roe wouldn't have been overruled. The court wouldn't be limiting the administrative state. The court wouldn't be advancing religion. The court wouldn't be expanding Second Amendment rights. We'd be having a very different conversation. If 49,000 votes had come out different in 2020, 
in three states, Donald Trump would be elected president. So I think one of the most important messages for all of our students is how much elections matter and how crucial it is to get involved in the political process. Yes. Uh, what would you propose for an ethical standard for justices of the Supreme Court? I think there's two key parts to that. One is what you put your finger on, the ethical standard. The other is the enforcement mechanism for the ethical standard. Let me deal with these one at a time. In terms of the ethical standard, that's actually the easy question. There are already ethical rules for federal court of appeals and federal district court judges. And there are ethical rules for the judges in all 50 states. In fact, the American Bar Association has a model code of judicial ethics. I would be content to apply the model code of judicial ethics to Supreme Court justices. I'd be content to apply to Supreme Court justices the same ethical rules that apply to lower federal court judges. But having those ethical rules isn't enough. There has to be an enforcement mechanism. Now, whether to participate in a case is left to each individual justice. Each justice decides whether he or she is going to be accused in that case. There's no enforcement mechanism, even if there are ethical rules. That has to change, too. There's varying ways to do that. You could have the chief justice, unless he's involved, ruling on this. You could have all the other justice rule on it. My colleague, former federal judge Jeremy Fogel, likes the idea of having three retired federal court of appeals judges decide whether justice is to be recused. But there has to be an ethical code for Supreme Court justices. And in addition to the ethical code, there has to be an enforcement mechanism. One of the things that I want to talk about as we go forward in this lecture series is how the Supreme Court now has its lowest approval ratings in American history. In a Marquette University poll in July 2022, 61% disapproval, and the Supreme Court had only 28% approval. I think that the lack of an ethics code and the lack of an enforcement mechanism is a self-inflicted wound on the Supreme Court. Every other judge in the country has to abide by ethical standards so should the Supreme Court justices, and there must be an enforcement mechanism. Now, implicit in your question is, should Clarence Thomas be recused in hearing cases arising from January 6th? And the answer is yes. Whenever a judge has a family member who has a personal involvement in a matter, the ethical rules say that the judge is recused from it. Now, the fact that Ginny Thomas has political views doesn't require that Clarence Thomas be recused. But the fact that Ginny Thomas was directly involved in events that led to January 6th, including the text she sent to White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadow, indicate that she had an involvement and Clarence Thomas should be recused. Unfortunately, we don't have an ethical code right now and we don't have any more force mechanism. Um, thank you for laying out a very painful picture of the reality we're facing. Uh, but I'm afraid that you're maybe not confronting the full immensity of the picture that you painted for us. <laughs> and um, um, it's a, you know, today would have been the 50th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. I'm wearing a t-shirt that says forced motherhood is female enslavement. And we live in a society that is now largely run by theocrats. And I guess I would pose a, a, a question back to you about the, the, um, I don't know, maybe the insanity is the word that comes to mind of relying on the normal political channels where in which uh, the, the, the balance is so completely off and you have a fascist packed Supreme Court with fascists all throughout every other sphere of government that are determined to remake America on a theocratic, openly white supremacist, male supremacist basis. And I would pose back to you a different two choices. Uh, from the revolutionary leader, Bob Avakian, who said, we have two choices, live with this and condemn future generations to the same or worse if they have a future at all, or make revolution and bring into being a radically different system and state power. Um, 
I understand that perspective and it receives some applause. I'm skeptical that there's going to be a revolution and if it happens that it's going to be with the values that you or I have. Um, I do think that we have to face very hard questions. Um, I think we have to face the inherent structural problems that stem from the Constitution. I think some terrible choices were necessary in order to create a Constitution that haunt us now. The Electoral College, a Senate with two senators per state, Supreme Court justices with life tenure. Can we amend the Constitution to change those things? Is it time for another constitutional convention and might it lead to a better document? Is there a point at which we have to think about the possibility of the country coming apart, of believing that there's more that divides us than unites us? But my own instinct is whatever we're going to do in those regards, if it's going to be successful, it's going to have to occur within the system rather than a revolution. Because I just don't think history gives us reason for hope that the revolution is going to get us where we want to go. But yeah. obviously there's different views. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to take this down from the federal perspective down to the state and local perspective. As you're probably aware, since you live in the, in the Bay Area, we had a DA in San Francisco was recall, was recalled over his activities. We have one here in Los Angeles who's been in battle. There's another one in New York who, who's in battle. What's your opinion of the activities of these folks, especially with regards to their obligation to protect the public with regard to liberalization of and releasing criminals? I'm pausing because it's such a hard question to give a short answer to. On the one hand, we tremendously over-incarcerate our society. The United States has 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. I can show you in a graph, if I knew how to do PowerPoint, which I don't, how the spending for education decreased in this state as spending for prisons went up. And so I think what Chase Sabudin and George Gascon were trying to do is to recalibrate the criminal justice system, trying to use it for serious and violent crimes and to not over-incarcerate. On the other hand, whether they went about it in the right way is a different question. Chase Boudin was recalled. The petition for recalling George Gascon narrowly failed. Um, whether that's reflecting the techniques they used or fear of crime, we can have a discussion about it. But I think we do need to overall rethink our criminal justice system. And again, we can talk about where the Boudin and the Gascon way is the right way to do it. But I think trying to find a lessening of a carceral state makes sense. Um, we just over-incarcerate for, for too many people for too long a period of time. And I think that's what Gascon and Boudin were trying to get at. But that doesn't get to where they were doing it in the right way. Good afternoon, Professor Schirmers. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for being here, and, and it's a great lecture. Thank you. We have heard over the last few years the term no one is above the law <laughs> over and over and over again. Could you address the issues with regards to the presidency and the law and other people of great power in the distribution of justice or lack thereof? Sure. You said the maxim no one is above the law and some laughed, hopefully not at that maxim, because I believe that that precept is the core of the rule of law. And as a lawyer and a law professor, I deeply believe in the rule of law. And it has to be that no one, not even the president, is above the law. I think that means that even a sitting president can be indicted and prosecuted. I don't know if you ever read the report by Robert Mueller. He said, because he was part of the Justice Department, and the Justice Department ruled that a sitting president could be indicted, 
he would not express any views on whether Donald Trump violated the law and obstruction of justice. But if you read the Mueller report, it left no doubt that Donald Trump violated the law with regard to the obstruction of justice and the investigation of what went on in the 2016 election. I think that a president should be able to be held civilly liable for violating the law. I don't believe that there should be any immunity of anybody when they violate the law. So to me, the maxim, no one is above the law, means that the law applies equally to the president as it does to you or me. And if the president violates the law, the president has to be held accountable. During the um, hearings before the Senate and the Congressional Judicial Committees, both now Justices Barrett and Gorsuch clearly stated that Roe v. Wade would remain the law of the land because of its long history. Clearly they were not telling the truth and now that they are confirmed justices, this has changed. Are they immune from what they perhaps perjured themselves during these hearings. Thank you. Let me start with your specific, take it more general, and then answer the question. In terms of the specifics, both Gorsuch and Barrett and Kavanaugh implied that they respect so-called precedent and super precedent, but they would never say that they wouldn't overrule Roe versus Wade. They wouldn't talk about any case. They wouldn't even talk about Marbury versus Madison. But clearly they implied respect for precedent. And there's reason to believe that Brett Kavanaugh gave some assurance to Senator Susan Collins that he wouldn't overrule Roe versus Wade. Um, I guess, you know, fingers crossed or whatever um, behind his back. Um, and I mean, I don't think there's any doubt that Clarence Thomas lied back in 1991 at his confirmation hearing. And apparently there's a movie right now at Sundance about Brett Kavanaugh. The reality is that the only remedy would be impeachment. It would take a majority of the House and two thirds of the Senate. And there is no history of impeaching a Supreme Court justice. And I don't think you'd ever get the bipartisan support that would necessary to do it. In terms of criminal prosecution, the statute of limitations has probably expired for all but Barrett. And again, I don't think any administration would undertake it. So the answer is, Yes, I believe that some of these individuals explicitly lied. Some gave a misleading impression, but they have their positions for life. Dean Chemerinsky, I wonder if you could talk a bit about the origination and evolution of the concept of standing within the U.S. Supreme Court and then specifically how it relates to, I believe there's a court on the docket right now for a web designer who is uh, contending that she does not have sure. to design for a um, same-sex marriage. Sure. The Supreme Court has said for a very long time that in order for someone to be able to sue in federal court, he or she needs to have standing. And this means that the person has to show that he or she has been personally injured, that the injury was caused by what the defendant did, and that a favorable court decision is likely to remedy that injury. And this is a body of law that's developed over the course of a century. And the Supreme Court has been pretty restrictive in recent years about who has standing. And now I can talk about your specific example. It's a case called 303 Creative versus Alenis. It was argued on Monday, December the 5th, and I will talk about it in the February 22nd lecture. Um, it involves a woman in Colorado, Lori Smith. Um, she has a business designing websites. She wants to expand it to design websites for weddings. And she says, she doesn't want to design websites for same-sex weddings. 
Colorado has a law that prohibits business establishments from discriminating based on race or sex or religion or sexual orientation. California has a similar law called the Unruh Act. And Lori Smith went to federal court and said, I want a declaratory judgment that this law is unconstitutional as applied to me because to apply it to me would violate my religion and my free speech rights. The federal district court and the federal court of appeals ruled against Lori Smith and upheld the Colorado law. They didn't do so on standing grounds. They said the government has a compelling interest in stopping discrimination based on sexual orientation. And that outweighs whatever interest Lori Smith has. I think that's right. I think that Lori Smith has shown that she won't expand her business if she has to serve same-sex couples. And that's an injury caused by the law and that the injury would be solved by striking down the law. So I don't think the primary problem in that case is about standing. I think that the lower courts were right that people don't have a constitutional right to discriminate against others. As I'll talk about when I come back to the case, I'm very worried once the Supreme Court says there's a right based on religion or speech discriminate against others, what of the landlord who says it violates my religious beliefs to rent property to an interracial couple? Or what about the employer who says that it violates my religious beliefs to have men and women in the same workplace, so I'm not going to hire any women? There's always a tension between liberty and equality. Any law that prohibits discrimination limits the freedom to discriminate. But our society, especially the Supreme Court, have made the choice for well over half a century that stopping discrimination is more important than protecting freedom to discriminate. And I think the Supreme Court's going to come out the other way. From the oral argument, I think it's clear it's going to be six to three in favor of Lori Smith. Um, but I don't think the main problem in the case is standing, because I understand why she's got a claim of an injury. I think the main problem is, of course, making a value choice that's going to have really terrible consequences for the future. Professor Chemerinsky, turning the discussion you started earlier about what might happen going forward or what could have happened if we'd gone back and results were different, go forward two years and assume we have a Republican president, a Republican Senate, and a Republican House. Could they pass a national law banning abortion? I think the answer to that is yes. Um, 20 years ago, Congress passed, when there was a Republican president and Republican Congress, the Federal Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act that prohibited a particular type of abortion procedure. And the Supreme Court in 2007 in Gonzalez versus Carhart upheld that as constitutional. Congress can regulate commerce among the states if what Congress is regulating is economic activity that taken cumulatively across the country has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. The Supreme Court said it's economic activity if it's commodities or services that are bought or sold. Abortions are paid for. And if you look at abortions across the entire country, you can say taken cumulatively in the aggregate this is a substantial effect on the economy. So I think Congress has the power, if it wanted to, to pass a law creating a national right to abortion, as it's passed other civil rights statutes, but I think it could also adopt a law that prohibits all abortions. And I predict if a Republican wins the presidency in 2024, and if the Republicans take both houses of Congress, they will pass such a law. The question will be, Will the Republicans be willing to change the filibuster rules in the Senate to overcome a Democratic filibuster? The Democrats in the Senate last spring wouldn't change the filibuster rules, but might the Republicans be willing to do so? So it really comes down to that specific question, assuming there's a Republican president, Republican Congress, because you know that their agenda, 
just like the Supreme Court's agenda is going to be to prohibit abortion. I keep reading and hearing about Supreme Court justice term being lifetime, but my understanding is the Constitution doesn't provide that. It only provides it for uh, good behavior. Article 3, Section 1 says that the justice of the Supreme Court and the lower federal courts shall have their positions so long as there's good behavior. In other words, they have their positions for life unless they're impeached or they resign. It's always been understood through American history that the Supreme Court and Federal Court of Appeals and Federal District Court judges have life tenure. And I personally favor term limits for Supreme Court justices. I said this a long time ago, long before the current court, that I favored 18-year non-renewable terms for Supreme Court justices. Some of it is that, thankfully, life expectancy is a lot longer now than it was in 1787. In 1787, average life expectancy was 37 years old. The framers didn't imagine justice is serving as long as they do now. Clarence Thomas was 43 years old when he was confirmed for the court in 1991. If he stays until he's 90, the age was just the Stevens retired, Thomas will be a justice for 47 years. Amy Coney Barrett was 48 years old when she was confirmed in 2020. If she stays on the court until she's 87, she'll be a justice until the year 2059. This is too much power in one person's hands for too long a period of time, whether the person is liberal or conservative, Republican or Democrat. I can put it another way. From 1787 to 1970, the average tenure of a Supreme Court justice was 15 years. Since 1970, for those who have left the bench, their average tenure is 27.5 years. Also, too much depends on the accident history when vacancies occur. There was a point I made in my introduction. Richard Nixon got to pick four justices in his first two years as president. Donald Trump got to pick three justices in his four years as president. Jimmy Carter got to pick no justices in his four years as president. 18-year non-renewable terms with a vacancy every two years would solve the problem. I think it would take a constitutional amendment, though I could make an argument, and some, such as Professor Kermit Roosevelt at the University of Pennsylvania made the argument that it could be done by federal statute, but it's always been the understanding that Article Three of the Constitution does provide life tenure. That's what being in office so long as a good behavior is thought to mean so until they're impeached or resigned. Hi, I was just uh, wondering if you could speak to uh, the Supreme Court's developing or changing use of emergency orders, or the so-called shadow docket, and the potential long-term implications. Sure. The Supreme Court has always had emergencies, and they've always been an emergency docket. The most famous examples have been in death penalty cases when somebody was facing execution and seeks a last minute stay of execution, it comes to the Supreme Court on an emergency basis. What's changed though is a dramatic expansion in rulings by the court in so-called emergencies where they're really deciding the merits of the case and they're not following the usual standards of appellate review. Steve Vladek, who's a professor at the University of Texas, has a wonderful book coming out this spring titled The Shadow Docket that goes into this. But let me give you two examples, one very recent, what I think the Supreme Court's really abused the shadow docket. One came down last spring, it's a case called Merrill versus Milligan, and it comes out of Alabama. The population of Alabama is 27% black. There are seven congressional seats from Alabama to the House of Representatives. When the Alabama legislature engaged in redistricting, it put black voters predominantly in one district, so they were a majority in only one district, and then spread the black voters out among the other districts. 
The result was that there was likely to be one black representative, the seven districts from Alabama in the House of Representatives. A three-judge federal court, two of the judges were conservative Trump appointees, found that this violated the Voting Rights Act. The Supreme Court, in a five to four order, stayed the new maps from being used, allowed the discriminatory maps to be used for the Alabama primary and general election. The result was it meant one more Republican in the House of Representatives and one less Democrat in the House of Representatives. There was no basis for the Supreme Court stepping in and staying the use of that districting. That wasn't an emergency that required that the Supreme Court issue a ruling. And they did so without any opinion. Um, it was just Kavanaugh wrote an opinion. Chief Justice Roberts joined the liberals in dissent. Another very troubling example happened on December 27th, just a few weeks ago. There's a federal law, Title 42, that allows the Center for Disease Control to be able to stop people from entering the United States to limit the spread of communicable disease. The Trump administration in the spring of 2020 used Title 42 to keep migrants from coming to the United States even though they'd otherwise be eligible to do so. These are people who would be able to come into the United States to apply for asylum or humanitarian relief. And a very large number of people who would have the right to come in the country have been kept out under Title 42. Last spring, the Biden administration said, we're going to suspend the Trump order. No longer is there a need to keep people out to stop the spread of communicable disease. A federal district court judge in Louisiana issued a preliminary injunction to stop the Biden administration from doing this, and that's on appeal to the Federal Court of Appeals. Meanwhile, in November of 2022, a federal district court judge in Washington, Emmett Sullivan, said, it's arbitrary and capricious to continue to use Title 42 in this way. He said the pandemic has sufficiently waned, there are vaccines, there are treatments, that it can't be said that we need to do this to stop the spread of communicable disease, and that's all Title 42 allows. 18 states sought to appeal this ruling to the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. The D.C. Circuit said, you weren't part of the litigation, you can't intervene now. They went to the United States Supreme Court. And on December 27th, the Supreme Court, in a 5-4 to four decision, stayed Judge Sullivan's ruling, saying that Title 42 should continue to be used to keep people out. On so many levels, this doesn't make sense. The only issue before the Supreme Court is whether the 18 states should be able to appeal. Well, the Supreme Court's not supposed to stay a lower court ruling unless there's a likelihood that it's going to find on the merits it was wrong. The merits of this aren't even before the Supreme Court. Also, as Justice Gorsuch, a conservative, said in dissent, Title 42 is just about limiting people from coming in to stop the spread of communal disease. That can't be justified any longer. This seems to me a terrible abuse of the shadow docket. And so what we're seeing is that the Supreme Court is using emergency orders to decide the merits and not following the usual standards of appellate review. And I could give you many more examples of that. I fear we're almost out of time. Is that right? Am I? Because, uh, thank you. I will be available. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I will be available to sign books outside or to chat. And I hope you'll come back on February 22nd and March 22nd. There's so much more to say about the Supreme Court. <laughs>